We are now being joined by Alima Lee McFarlane. Once again, we'll begin with a few questions from the media. Steve Jewin, go ahead. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Ali Malay. It's always great when I get a chance to talk to the champ, and hopefully Dan will give us a little leeway since we don't get the one-on-ones like we used to. But first of all, I've been humbled a few times on this call already. Nate Andrews, Linton Vassell, and the loquacious and venerable Gareth A. Davies. So if you could do me the honor and humble me one more time as I concede to him that he is the better man, what is the difference between a Brabo choke and a Dars choke? A Brabo choke? Yes. Nate Did Andrews you... told me he didn't get a Brabo choke when I asked him that. Oh, I don't even know, dude. I'm 10th Planet. We have like completely different terms. I don't even know what a Brabo choke is. <laughs> So yeah, so yeah, I, I won't be humbling you. <laughs> oh well, I guess I get off easy today then. But speaking of not getting off easy, this pandemic has been hard on everyone, and I know it's especially hard on you because right now is the time of year where we'd be talking about you going home, seeing your family, having a luau, enjoying yourself, defending the title at Neil's Blaisdell Arena. So how hard is it for you to have a title fight in these circumstances? Um, you know, it's actually, I'm just grateful because the fact that we're even fighting is, um, you know, it's just, there's a lot of people who haven't been able to fight, who aren't getting paychecks. There's a lot of businesses that have been forced to close down because of this year. So I'm honestly just grateful uh, that despite it being very weird circumstances uh, during fight week, uh, you know, with with the whole quarantining and everything and extra precautions, um, I'm just, again, very grateful to even have this opportunity. So... No, you, you won't hear any gripes from me about um, not being in Hawaii this time of year because it's it's fine. As long as I'm getting a fight, I'm totally cool with it. All right, just two more from me. First, then, since training has obviously been different under these circumstances, I know you're grateful to still be competing, defending the world title, but do you feel like you're fully prepared for an undefeated fighter as an undefeated fighter yourself? Yeah, I think I had a really great camp. Um, you know, my same training partners were still there. And I had a normal, as normal as it could be under the circumstances, I had a, a very normal training camp. You know, our, our gym, fortunately, we were considered um, an outdoor gym because we have warehouse doors. So as long as we kept those up, then it was fine. The only real... Um, I guess, uh, what's it called? The only real adjustments we had to make was uh, towards the end of the camp, you know, coming down to the last two weeks or so was when we really had to, you know, I started wearing my mask to practice and just really limiting my partners just because, um, uh, you know, the chance of, of contracting something uh, leading up to this fight. So that was the only real adjustments that we had to make. But otherwise, I thought I had a great camp. All right. And last from me, as I concede to Gareth A. Davies that he is the better man since he will probably be following me next on the line. What do you make of Juliana Velasquez as an opponent compared to the other title fights where you've successfully defended the belt? Um, I think Juliana is a lot more of an intimidating physical fighter than any of my former opponents. Um, you know, she's she's bigger than me. She has a bit uh, longer reach, really aggressive and physical. So I think um, I think that's one of the main differences between her and my other opponents. Uh, I, I, I feel like this fight's going to be really tiring. You know, I'm going to be exerting a lot of physical effort and um, trying to take her down, trying to strike with her. So, uh, yeah, I, th I feel like my other fights were very strategic, um, but with her, it's going to be a very physical fight. Ryan? Thank you. Uh, so my main question is, you know, Scott Coker has kind of teased the concept of maybe having a women's flyweight Grand Prix, but he wanted to see how this fight uh, unplayed with, with you uh, and Juliana. Do you think that a victory for you increases or decreases the chances of that happening? Honestly, whatever happens tomorrow, I, I hope it doesn't change anything as far as like wanting to do the, the fight. I, I think if she wins or if I win, there still should be a Grand Prix for the women's flyweight division. Um, I think that people would prefer to watch 
us fight over any other, I don't want to call them out. Okay, over the bantamweight guys. I mean, I would like to see the women fighting a women's Grand Prix. We haven't had our chance. You know, the featherweight women haven't had their chance. We haven't had our chance. So I think it's just time. And I think that had the pandemic not have happened, then we would be in a tournament right now. So yeah, I, I hope that regardless of what happens on Thursday, um, it's, it's still going to happen. And away away, you continue to set records in the sport and you're solidifying your legacy. You know, hopefully we do get to see that flyweight Grand Prix go on. And with all of that, what is this fight and what do all of these fights really mean to solidifying your career in Bellator? Ah, oh, man. I mean, honestly, I feel like I've already made history quite a bit. And uh, regardless of the outcome on Thursday, I'll still be in the history books. <laughs> So at this point, to be totally honest, like I am just having fun with my fights. I'm finally being able to enjoy, you know, I feel like a lot of pressure has been lifted off of me um, because I, I have accomplished a lot in this division and uh, in my career and, you know, in the sport itself, I've accomplished a lot. So at this point in my career, I am really starting to enjoy the process, enjoy the camps, you know, enjoy um, the evolution of my of my skills as a mixed martial artist. And so, um, you know, and, I've, and I'm like, I want to take fun fights. Like I want to fight overseas. I want to fight in the ring and, and um, Saitama Arena, you know, I want to do a, a cross promotional fight with Ryzen. So it's like, again, I, I just, now I, I feel a lot more relaxed, um, you know, not, not taking my opponents lightly, but just like, I don't have as much pressure as people think I have um, being champion because I feel like I've done a, a good job of being champion and, and I've, um, I've reached a lot of the heights of, uh, that one could reach in their career. And so now it's, uh, I'm just enjoying the process a little bit more and not putting so a little pressure bit on me. Gareth? Gareth? Good evening, Alima from London. Hi, Gareth. Hi, Gareth. Hi there. How are you doing? I won't give the other guy who's... N I'm not going to even say his name. Yeah? <laughs> the guy that was... Because he's, you know... It, it's, I'm not letting him get that because I'm living rent-free in his head right now. <laughs> but um, just wanted to ask you... And we're only kidding around. Um, I just wanted to ask you... You used a lot of enjoying rhetoric just then. You're enjoying, you're enjoying it so much, and we, we've enjoyed you an enormous amount as champion. And you know the the things you've done and the power you've used it for. Can you say to me though that this is probably the biggest challenge you've had while being champion in terms of what Juju Velasquez brings stylistically to the fight against you? Yes, what she brings. Yes, what she brings. Yes, I, I consider it the biggest challenge so far. I mean, I, I would say that um, Valerie Laterno at that stage of my career was my biggest challenge, you know, because of her pedigree, um, her experience in the sport, how long she's been in the sport. Um, but I would say that stylistically, Juliana is my biggest challenge to date. Um, not only is she a southpaw, which you know you don't really fight a lot of southpaws, um, but she's bigger. She seems very physically strong. She goes for the finish. She has a, an extremely similar record to mine, and um, I think her mentality too. You know, she's ready. She's ready to be champion. You know, she she works hard. Um, and she wants this a lot. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think, uh, and stylistically too, you know, even though she really likes to stand and bang, she's a black belt in judoka, which I've never faced before. So that should be interesting too. Definitely my biggest challenge so far. Brilliant. Thank you. And just a final one from me, cause Dan wants to move us all on very quickly tonight. Um, the, the, does it make a difference? Would it have made it? I mean, those. I've had the privilege myself of going to the two events that you had in Hawaii. Um, it was amazing. Do you think it makes a difference not being in Hawaii for you this time? Because once a year, you've been able to carry an event in your homeland. Um, for me personally, I don't think it makes a difference because I think it's um, it's kind of a nice change up. Um, and there's a lot less going on, you know, a lot less I need to focus on now. I can just kind of focus just on the fight, um, just on making weight and the fight. However, I do think that the disadvantage of it not being in Hawaii is um, for my opponent because uh, my opponents 
Uh, to be fighting in my hometown in front of that crowd, uh, I think is very, very intimidating and is a kind of a huge mind f bomb for them. And you know, you can see it when you watch rewatch those fights when they introduce my opponent, and the whole crowd is just dead silent. You can hear a pin drop in there. You know, there'll be occasional boos and everything, but it's just dead. And then, um, and then. You know my walkout comes. It's I think that can be really uh, mentally, mentally intimidating to my opponent. So I think that's going to be the biggest difference. Um, it doesn't really have any effect on me, but for my opponent, it does. Donna. Hey, Alimale, uh, how's it going? Hi, it's going good. Um, I wanted to talk to you a bit about uh, your your good friend Heather Hardy. She's you're very close with her, right? Yeah, She's yeah, that's been... my girl. She's been very outspoken this last week about uh, in in boxing or the last couple of weeks about uh, uh, you know women's issues in the sport in terms of pay in terms of positions on cards. Have you been keeping up with with what she's been saying? Have you been talking to her about things like that? Yes, we uh, you know in fact when the lockdown first happened, we were. Uh, you know, talking almost daily, and we even did a live on social on Instagram about uh, women's pay and sports. It was more geared towards uh, the relationship side of things, like if the woman is the breadwinner, how does that work out in the relationship? Um, but we definitely talked about yeah, women's pay and sports, and I'm 100% behind Heather and and uh, asked her to share her experiences with um, yeah, being paid in the boxing industry as a woman. And so, yeah, I have been following her. I mean, this last week, not so much just, you know, because I have a fight and everything. Um, but, yeah, we're, we're homies, and I, I completely support, um, you know, everything that she's fighting for. Obviously, you're not there, so you would only be hearing it secondhand from, from people like Heather. But why do you think it is that women's MMA seems to have just raced ahead of the pack when it comes to, to, to pay, when it comes to equality in in the, the the way the cards are structured, I mean, it's it's completely not abnormal. It's not something that's even a talking point that you would be headlining this card, or that Chris Cyborg or Amanda Nunes and the other promotion. Why is it that the WMA has has raced ahead of of women's boxing so much? Um, I think it's because of promoters like Scott Coker. I mean, Scott has always been supportive of women's MMA. He was the one, I, I would say that he was the one that practically founded it and um, gave a stage and gave uh, a platform and the spotlight to women um, in MMA. So I think it's individuals like him that have allowed um women's MMA to excel and he's the one that's putting us as the headliners you know he's never doubted us from the beginning other promotions have um, they have literally went out and said that we will never see women in the cage fighting ever um, but Uncle Scott has never been like that he's always been supportive of us so I think it's um, because of guys like him that we uh, you know we don't have to fight as much um, you know, for stuff like equal pay or for uh, exposure or ch opportunities to fight on the main car, opportunities to headline um, and to sell out events. Uh, it's because of it's because of promotions like Bellator and uh, our, our promoters like Scott Coker. Mark. Um, Alima, uh, thanks for taking taking these questions. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your charity work. I know it's something that I don't think we've, we've people have discussed the past couple times during these uh, press conferences. But tell me a little bit about that. I mean, obviously the uh, the pandemic may have may have hindered a little bit of your charity work, but tell, just can you give us kind of an update on what's uh, going on with some of your charitable uh, endeavors? Yeah, so um, back in February, I, I put on a retreat for Native women and girls as an intergenerational and intertribal retreat for, um, you know, it was to, I, I took them back to my homeland, back to Oahu, and, um, you know, these were women and girls from nations all over the world, including, um, you know, the Lakota and Dakota nations in um, the Midwest. I had uh, members of the Kumeyaay Nation in Southern California um, and again from all over the world and I took them back home to Hawaii to uh, put them through a women's retreat that would um, encompass self-love self-discipline um, self-defense 
and uh, you know protection of the sacred, uh, which included our land and you know our bodies as as women. So anyway, that was um, that was part of the my scholarship program that I do outside of the cage. And unfortunately, we, um, yeah, we haven't been able to do anything because uh, what my scholarship provides is travel opportunities for these girls. Um, and um, again, we're not allowed, to, we were not able to do that um, for the rest of 2020. But, um, you know, I have talked about my next um, goal or my next endeavors. I do want to rent a trailer or um, a big RV or something. And I want to do a cross country road trip and visit reservations and put on free uh, self-defense seminars for the children and for the women out there. Um, and I have been able to do uh, several self-defense seminars during the pandemic on, on several reservations. And I, I have another one lined up after this fight. And um, yeah, I just, I don't charge anything for these seminars because uh, as long as it's, it's involving native women and girls, because statistically um, that demographic faces the highest rates of violence. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't charge anything because, you know, they, that's not how I make my money. Um, and this is how I, I give back. So keep an eye out. Hopefully I can do it in 2021, my cross country road trip to visiting, um, reservations across the nation. Thanks a lot. And, and, and thank you for your uh, continuing endeavors. Thank you. All right. Last one, Jay. Hey, thanks very much. And uh, Alima, a couple from me, if you don't mind. Um, we spoke to Juliana last week, spoke to her again today during the uh, media day, and she mentioned that she had been expecting to fight you last year. Um, you wound up fighting Jackson. She wound up fighting Bruna Ellen. Was there talk of a fight between the two of you back in Hawaii last year? Um, there wasn't anything official, but, you know, when, um, you know, post-fight, when they're like, oh, like, who do you see yourself fighting next? Um, I did throw her name out there. I always throw out a couple of names, uh, just, you know, girls that were on my radar, but there was nothing, there was nothing official. Um, but I do think I said her name after like the Valerie fight. I was like, oh yeah, I've been keeping an eye on Velasquez and, and so, and so, you know, I threw a couple names out there, but again, nothing official. And, you know, you kind of mentioned it in that she uh, does look like your toughest test to date, a stronger, strong physical fighter. Um, you opened as the favorite in this. Um, it's still close, but some sites have you as the underdog right now, and it is the closest fight on the card. Is that mo motivational for you at all, or are you more of a never-tell-me-the-odds uh, Indiana Jones kind of person? Um, yeah, I don't really, I don't even understand how odds work, honestly. Uh, I don't think I've ever, I've ever bet on anything in my life before. So I'm kind of like, I don't get it, but, uh, I don't, I also don't care about numbers going into a fight. I never have. Um, if I did care, I feel like that's just my ego speaking and you want to try to stay away from ego as much as possible before a fight. All right. Thank you, Alima. Good luck.